All right, well, I am so pleased to see all of your faces this morning. Thanks so much for being here. And uh, the Ask Lead Seminar is a more informal setting for us to discuss leadership topics that come up in my informal conversations with you. And, you know, Brian and the rest of staff and I sit down uh, usually in September and we try to figure out what are the questions that you all have been asking. And I think one of the things that consistently has come up is to explain this leadership life cycle. In fact, Marilyn Teich was uh, saying on the way in this morning that she would like to know more about the leadership life cycle and how it applies to your lives. Now, those of you who know how I like to talk, this, this to me is going upstream. I don't like to sit. So if I, if I stand up and start walking around, you'll understand your parents. I usually uh, have to to sort of spin off some energy when I'm giving a talk, and this is very foreign to me to be sitting here <laughs> looking at this table like this, but I will try to contain myself a little bit. Uh, the first thing that I want to do is make sure we have a baseline for what leadership is. I like to go through a few definitional issues first, and then from there we'll go into the life cycle per se. And I hope you brought your thinking caps because it's going to end on a participatory note. What I'd like to do in the third part after reviewing the life cycle in general it, is ask you all a specific question about a leader in your life, okay? So those are the uh, three things I'd like to do this morning. Go over general definitions of leadership traits, go over the life cycle in general, and then specifically over some of the uh, people in your life who have served as leaders. Okay, well, with regard to traits, uh, I go out and talk to a lot of people about leadership. That's one of the interesting things. When you go out, uh, People expect me to talk to them about leadership, but I always end up asking audiences, what do you think good leaders do? What are uh, good leaders' traits? And here are some of the things that I hear again and again. The first on the list, always, character. Having a great character. It's a character, it's a trust that has to be earned. Uh, it doesn't come on a silver platter. And leaders know they have to guard their character more than anything else. You guard your character more than anything else. The second thing that good leaders know is that there has to be a vision of something better. You know, leadership is not about managing so much the status quo. It's about changing something in the status quo for the better. We can train a lot of people to manage the status quo better and better, and thank goodness there are those people. That's a very important function. But the leader always sees something that's a, that, that extra spark, has some vision for how to make something better for all of us, not for the leader, but for the people the leader serves. And it's that extra spark, which means that the leader tries to, to, to bring that vision into focus for the people that he's or she is serving. The third thing is leaders have energy. You know, you've, you've got to be able to make the meetings. You've got to be able to meet all of the demands that are going to be on you. If you have a posture of serving others uh, and not just yourself, you've got to sacrifice a lot in your schedule, and that's appropriate. What I've discovered going out and talking to leaders is that leaders are often very energized. They want to go out and be with others, and they find it an affirming experience when they've been able to bring people together and, and articulate a vision that moves everybody forward. Fourth, leaders have a moral and spiritual voice. We saw this so poignantly at Penn State in the recent crisis there. You know, when the students went out and began rioting uh, right after uh, the coach there, Joe Paterno, was fired, uh, the, the response there caused a lot of attention on the fact that there was not a voice for those students. The students were hungering for some kind of voice to articulate where the school was going to go, how the school was going to heal, how this big family, this big team, much bigger than the football team, of course, was going to put it back together. They were hungering for that moral and spiritual voice, saying that this is a lot more than about firing a coach. This is a crisis that needs to be addressed. And that voice wasn't there. And so the energy, all the energy they had, the outlet for that energy was turning over cars and you know burning things, and that's obviously reflective of a lack of leadership, a tragic lack of leadership, because if a leader had been able to step in, then those things wouldn't have happened. This connects to the fifth point. 
leaders are able to motivate, they're able to motivate others to think about something besides I, me, mine. And you hear me say that a lot. Leadership is not about I, me, mine. It's not about, you know, one's personal agenda. It's about that bigger vision. For example, in our, in our case here at the Hallenstein Center, it's about Ralph Hallenstein. You know, and he never had to say that. He never had to come to our staff and say, you know what, I want you to lengthen the legacy of Ralph Hallenstein. But if you have somebody at the top who has such integrity, has such character, has accomplished so many things, been a leader in so many arenas, you want to serve that person. You want to lengthen their legacy. Ralph motivates by his being. Good leaders motivate by the integrity of their being and their ability to bring people together because they do have goodwill for others and they have that, they have that knack, they have social skill. They have a knack not of dividing people, but of bringing people together. They go into a room and they, they search for the things that unify people rather than divide them. Now they have the capacity, say they're running a, a political race, they certainly have the capacity to see what divides people. But their basic posture is, when they come into a room, is not, here I am, you know, and you just need to hang on every word I say, but there you are, and you, and you, and you, and I can't wait to get to know you. And I'm gonna find out what our similarities are, and I'm gonna try to bridge those similarities so that we can do things. I used to watch, you know, I worked for Governor Engler for a dozen years. And I used to watch how he would work a room. It's remarkable. He would take people who didn't have hardly anything in common with each other. Come on in. Hardly anything in common with each other. And he would, he would find very quickly what issue united them all. And he said, what we're going to do before we do anything else is find that issue around which we can rally. And you see, that sets a group on a pattern. It, it, it positively reinforces a very important point that we can cooperate. We're not interested in dividing each other. We're cooperating. We're working together. Because once you have that little success under your belt, it's easier then to get to the next success and the next success and the bigger success. Engler always used to do that. He was brilliant at it. Even though the room would, you know, every, you'd go to Congress as a governor of Michigan and you would see, you know, every, Every person in Congress wants to protect their district and get their money and they're their, their very territorial about those things. But he, he found that way to cut through that. He could motivate people toward a consensus and common action. I like to say, follow, following uh, Robert Dalek, that leaders have a sense of good luck. They're survivors. Leaders are survivors. They have a, a way of, I mean, every leader has numerous challenges. But they work hard, they create opportunity, and they survive. I had the, um, the honor of speaking to the president of Poland, Lech Walesa. This was in 2006. And I said, President Walesa, what is the criterion that you look at before you make a, a, an important appointment to somebody or uh, you know, try to bring somebody onto your team? And he said, well, if they're generals, do they win battles? You know, there's an element of luck there. And some people have it, and some people don't. And you have to be able to be a discerning individual to see it. The other thing, uh, a seventh element here, is uh, leaders know how to navigate the politics of their organization. They know what's going on up above their organization, and they certainly know what's going on below their organization. They know the resources that are available from above, and they know the support and the divisions and the trials and all the things that are brewing below. Uh, so they're, they're, they're looking at how their organization, it's like an ecology. How does their organization fit in to this institutional ecology above and below? And it's very important because they understand their primary responsibility is to be a steward of the institution that they lead, a steward of that institution, and a steward there by, by extension, of the community that that institution is a part of. They are a steward of something much greater than themselves. Again, it's not I, me, mine. It's a much bigger thing that they're, they're keeping their eye on. And I, those of you um, who've heard or seen the Paul Hilligans uh, video, Paul, Speaker Hilligans, does a 
great job hitting this point about being a steward as a leader of the institution by extension of the community. Well, those are the, uh, those are the primary the seven or eight uh, baseline criteria that I'd like to throw out there that leaders have in common. These are just little uh, traits that I've collected over the years talking to a lot of people. Uh, if you talk to me next year, it's likely to change a little bit. The list changes uh, as, as uh, we grow in our institutional knowledge here at the Hallenstein Center. But it's basically going to rotate around those. Any questions about those traits before we go on to the leadership life cycle? Okay, well, I've given you a handout. Take a look at this leadership life cycle. Uh, you'll see that it has five elements on it. Um, it starts with leading yourself, following others. That's actually where we're going to end today, following others. Uh, leading a team, leading an organization, and crisis and background. When Brian Flanagan and I first started talking about how to make this leadership academy sing, our vision was to make sure that a person could come into the Leadership Academy and no matter where they were in their leadership development, they could identify some things uh, that they'd already achieved and some, some skills that they could continue to acquire. And that's where we came up with this idea of a life cycle where, you know, it doesn't matter if you're 16 or 61, you're somewhere on the cycle. Yes, even a 61-year-old is still learning how to lead herself. Even a 61-year-old is going to be learning how to follow others. Presidents of the United States in their 70s are still learning how to follow when they have to. But let's start with the bottom designation here, leading a team. You know, a lot of leaders cut their teeth. They, they begin someplace by leading a team. A team, let's just define a team real easily. It's where you know everybody's first name. You're on a first name basis with everybody. It's like a coach. It's like uh, Apollo 13. It's like um, um, the Navy SEALs. It's uh, an organization where people know what motivate each other and the attitude should be all for one and one for all. And shame on anybody in the team that seeks to divide it. Seriously, they're not a team member. It's all for one or one for all. That is the point of, a, of leading a team. If you don't have a team, uh, you just have these atomistic individuals with their own I, me, mine agendas, and that will destroy the team very quickly. So the leader's responsibility is to make sure that personality and uh, conflict among personalities is not dominant, but that the emphasis remains on mission, vision, values and tasks. The way to overcome a, a team that descends into uh, personality is to get oriented again on mission, vision, values, and tasks. That's leading a team. But there comes a point where you perhaps have the opportunity to lead an organization. An organization is bigger than a team. You don't have the opportunity to know everybody on a first name basis. You don't have the opportunity to be able to say, I know what motivates Jennifer Max. I know what motivates, say, Jordan or Kathy. And I know, you know, which buttons to push to help them do their best and be their best. That's what a good team leader does. But all of a sudden, if you're finding yourself with a large organization, you are dependent still on a team around you. And then, as we used to say in Lansing, with that, it's that team that helps you reach out to the larger organization. And they do so, so by uh, magnifying the, the message and multiplying the messengers. So you, you have a communication function that's really important there in leading an organization. And this is where the politics is also very important. You need to know how to appropriate resources. You need to know, you know what powers above your organization are going to influence it. Is it going to be legislation in Lansing or Washington that will impinge on how you work? Are there, is there restlessness, a lack of harmony below that you need to be mindful of that will have an impact on the organization? But that's the key to understanding the organization. You still, the leader still needs the team, but you have to magnify that message and multiply the messengers to get them the word out about what you're doing. Again, going back to mission, vision, values, and the tasks that have to be done. 
as you're trying to improve the situation. Let's look at the third area, crisis. Crisis always hits. You know, life is a struggle. Uh, there, there's no primrose path through life. And the sooner you learn that life will be a struggle and you have to adapt to the struggle, and the sooner you understand what you can legitimately control and what you cannot really control, because that just leads to neurosis or narcissism, <laughs> the happier you'll be. You cannot control the way other people feel about you, for example. Now, crises are of two types. You have internal crises and you have external crises. The internal crises are the ones we cause ourselves if, for example, we act unethically and have a bad conscience. Or we break trust with people because we do something that's really out of bounds. Uh, sometimes it happens, you know, that uh, an internal crisis can come from stress. Maybe you don't do something ethically uh, improper, but there is just there are stressors in, in each of our lives, and you have to come to work dealing with stress, and you have to come to work putting your game face on. It doesn't matter what kind of fight you had with your spouse that day. It doesn't matter what the bank said to you or the bill that came in or the IRS. You got to put your game face on. You got to you got to check that personal material at the door and you come in to work ready to play, ready to do the job, and stay focused on the mission, the values, the vision, the tasks. You keep your personality out of it to the extent that is necessary for the team, the organization, to be effective. Sometimes the crises, though, are external. Uh, this often happens um, when resources are suddenly cut. All of a sudden, you don't have the budget you thought you would have. Uh, it happens with bad media. It happens with rivalries and jealousies from outside that you are not responsible for. But deal with them you must. You still have to deal with the stressors. And of course the successful leader knows not to panic in these situations. Uh, it's the attitude that this too shall pass. It always does. But you just have to be smart about it. John Engler used to say, there are a hundred bad ways to do something. Always. Too hasty, too thoughtless, driven by personal motivation and not with regard to the team. There are one or two smart ways to do something. Give thought to what you're doing. Make sure that your response to a crisis is, is the smart way to go. Okay. Then leading yourself. You know, we learn how to lead ourselves very early on in our our childhood. We learn, for example, how to start manipulating the environment. A baby cries to get milk. Voila, the baby is fed. Um, children, toddlers learn, you know, that how to manipulate in sort of that saccharine sort of way. Those of you who are parents know this and see this, or grandparents in the room, you see that the, the child will come up and be very coy very solicitous, you know, daddy, can I have this, Mom, you know. We learn from a very early age how to lead ourselves to get an impact in the environment. Um, all manipulation is not bad, not at all. In fact, we all manipulate all the time. But here's the criterion. Are you manipulating others for yourself or for the good of the team? That's the question. If you're manipulating others for your personal gain, for your little emotional agenda, then that's not a good thing for a leader to do. If on the other hand, you're manipulating by communication and by cajoling and by sticks and carrots, if you're manipulating to get people to come on board an agenda for a bigger agenda than I mean mine, that's a good thing. There is nothing wrong with that kind of manipulation. We all engage in it. But it comes down to leading yourself and knowing how to behave appropriately in those circumstances. And learn how to lead ourselves as leaders is extremely important. And then the last is following others. We have to learn humility. You know, leaders, one of the interesting things, again, working about, around congressmen, talking to, I had the privilege of talking with three presidents of the United States. Um, again, Engler is a governor. You know one of the things that I discovered about these people? They're listeners. 
they're not the type who want to dominate the agenda or the conversation all the time. When they have a job to do, they certainly will. But they're listening to what people are saying. They're good listeners. Good leaders are good li listeners because good leaders know that leadership's about relationship. It's about connecting. Good leaders have the humility to know when to be quiet and listen to what people around them are saying. Now this makes it incumbent upon the people around them to speak up, to communicate with them directly and in good faith, and not in a destructively manipulative way. But the good leader knows that sometimes it's okay, often it's okay to follow, and especially after a crisis. Crises come along and we learn, we haven't learned something in life that we need to yet. It's time to listen. What am I supposed to learn out of this tension, out of this issue? And so you, you talk to people, uh, you listen, you're humble enough to take good advice. You don't let pride and stubbornness get in the way. Because that'll sink you every time. As that writer said in Proverbs, pride goeth before fall. Don't want to be prideful man or a woman, not in a leadership position, you listen. And then you do, do that gut check, and then you can do, hopefully, what is right. All of us have several voices in our head. We're not crazy. <laughs> we have the voices in our head that we consult all the time. You know, for the people I know well in this room, I know who your voices are. It comes out in conversation because you've told me. You've told me who you listen to when there's a crisis in your life. Sometimes people struggle when I present this part of the leadership life cycle uh, because when I start asking people who are the voices in their head that they depend on to guide them through a crisis, is it their mom? Is it their dad's voice? Is it a pastor's voice? Is it a teacher's voice? A coach's voice? A dear friend's voice? Uh, a boss that you've had? Um, a staffer you've had? Because of their wisdom, too. What is that voice in your head? And it, if you listen carefully to people, you know what their voices are. That's a beautiful thing. Because you want to hear the voices coming through in that conversation. Because you'll learn something. You'll learn to be a better follower as a leader. Some people, as I started to say, have trouble with this because they don't come from a good home. Maybe they didn't come from good parents. Maybe they didn't come from a good school. They don't have that teacher, that mom, or that dad who was able to instruct them. But you know what they have? Maybe they've read, or maybe they've seen somebody on TV. And I'm serious, we should not denigrate that. I've had people at some of these seminars uh, get almost tearful and say, you know, I didn't have anybody growing up. And so, you know, Martin Luther King became my voice. What would Martin Luther King do in this situation? Or Billy Graham became my voice. What would Billy Graham do in my situation? Or somebody who loves history, reads history. George Washington, this titan among the founders. What would he do? You read enough biographies, you have a sense. You start to form that voice. And that's okay. So in the exercise that we're about to do, don't feel that you're at loose ends if you can't point to the person that's sort of in our, most of our natural life cycle, a mom or a dad or a teacher or a coach, if it's somebody a little bit farther out there that you know more, maybe more in the abstract, that's perfectly okay. But what I want you to do now is think about something. You know the little bracelets that came out in the mid-1990s that said WWF? JD. JD. Yeah. Now, let's leave the religion aside. This is going to be a secular exercise, unless, but you're certainly welcome to, to present a religious leader if you wish. But imagine yourself creating a bracelet. Every one of you is facing a serious challenge right now because you have a pulse. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but everybody who's alive has got a serious challenge you're dealing with. It could be anything from making sure you spend more time with your loved ones in a truly meaningful way, to an issue with your schooling. You know, you're, you're, not, you're not getting what the teacher is asking, the professor is asking for. 
to an issue at work that has caused tension, to an, an issue with your neighbor, it could be the IRS coming after you, everyone's got an issue. And when you focus on that issue, you naturally do something. You naturally migrate to that voice. WWD. And what we would like to do now is just take a minute to think about the voice in your head that's dealing, that's saying something to you. And I'd like for you to write that down. I'm going to ask you to tell us the name of the person, the role they played in your life. And I want you to share with us how they've made a difference. We're going to create your hall of heroes. Who would like to go first? Now, I'm a classroom professor. If you avoid my eyes, fall on you. Please, George. Okay. Um, the approach that I took to this will come out from my answer, I think. Uh, there was no one person for me. There's a lot of voices in my head all the time. And I think this came out clearly in my interview with Brian um, when I joined the Palestine Science Center, was that there were so many remarkable people in, in my journey uh, that helped me get to where I was today. But one of the things that I thought about was early in my career, I was very fortunate um, to help someone tell me, you can't do that. Um, and it kind of inspired me to reach out to multiple people. And I had to practice being uncomfortable. Um, and I got really good at that. And being able to engage different people in conversation and know that from the individual on the bar stool next to you or the individual in the boardroom, what I learned was that everyone had something to offer. And in my journey, I've compiled all these different lessons and all these different people in my mind that I think about all the time when I'm presented with a challenge. And there's always someone that kind of rises out in my head and shares with me a, a specific message. Um, so yeah, there's, there's too many. But is there a voice that, in, in, in that crowd that you're lucky to walk with, is there one that comes back again and again a little stronger than the others? There is one, um, and it's someone that I worked with early in my career, and we were um, presented with an issue. Um, at that time, she was a public relations director for the mayor of the city of Anchorage, and we were working on an awareness campaign and she looked at me and she said, this is great and I've got somebody that will fund it, but how do we raise more awareness by what we're doing? How do we look at this differently? How did you use your passion around innovation and creativity to look at this and say, put it out there. You know, if you don't do it, somebody else is gonna do it. And that's something that comes back to me and just circled back to me a couple days ago. One, one of the team members that I work with, um, I asked her to reach out to an organization here in town and ask her to do something very different. And she said, I was laughing to myself as I wrote this email and hoping that someone was going to take this seriously. And I said, well, look, if you weren't that uncomfortable, somebody else a couple months or a couple weeks or a couple years down the road, is going to ask that same question, but we can be the one to do that now. Um, so being uncomfortable and looking at things very differently and willing to take a risk. Um, you know, and, the, and one last piece of advice that somebody gave me recently when I switched positions after a long career with the Red Cross. You know, in the Red Cross, you're, we were in the business of, of saving lives and part of our, our business and our mission, but now I'm not in that business anymore. And someone said to me, you know, take some risks. So that was another good piece of advice. Thank you, Jordan. What was the individual's name whom you originally referenced? Heather Handyside. Heather. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Don't laugh. We'll just put Heather up here. How about that? Okay, a colleague at work. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Who else? Yes, please. I'll go. Um, Last summer, I had the fortune to uh, work for Senator Bill Hardman, the Union for Congress, and uh, I got to spend quite a bit of time with him. I was a volunteer coordinator for the campaign, and even though um, we lost, obviously, and I always liked to work on the campaign, and I got to meet a lot of nice volunteers, but more importantly, I got to spend a lot of time with um, Bill and Clover themselves, and their level of 
dedication to um, each other and to their constituents. And I mean, just absolute role model. As someone that, Bill was a guy that had made mistakes early on in his life and then had, you know, gotten past them certain to Vietnam and come back and, you know, been cat with mayor for so many years and then state senator. Um, just his, his down to earth, his humility, and the ability for him just to talk to you as a person. Um, like, I constantly think about if we in a bad situation, what would Bill do in this? How does he overcome this? And what lesson would I learn from it? Can I call him a boss? Yeah, I guess. Can you give us an example? I'm going to ask you to take a little risk here. Would you share an example with us of how your father-in-law actually guided you? It's, it's tough to come up with specifics. I, I don't he, want to he, never, he never reacts very quickly. And I just remember um, when I was dating my wife, seeing the way he, he treated her with utmost respect and he had to do anything for her. So I use that as an example. Good. No, I like that. He modeled what he wanted you to be. Yeah. Very good. Generous. Yeah, I'd like to share. <laughs> and I guess I'm in Jordan. Yes. Yeah, I guess I'm like Jordan when you raised the question, my reaction was, wow. Whenever there's a situation, it's always a positive voice that comes to mind, but it may be a different voice, yeah. quite frankly. But when, when, you, when I'm forced to kind of figure out sort of who would be the persons in the Hall of Fame, and I'm sure you've heard this one all the time, is the team of my mother and father. Because, and I view that as a team, and almost invariably when the tough situations arise, I get those two voices coming to me in very meaningful ways. Uh, and sometimes even addressing the, the two conflicting sides of the issue <laughs> and helping me to res resolve it because they, they balance each other so well and therefore my life was so balanced that as I, as I grew up and as I started to meet you know, great persons as I've been able to move through, through my career, it's interesting to me how many times what I'm hearing or what I'm feeling or what I'm interacting um, and what I'm earning from those interactions I almost always can go back to my mother and father and what they have shared with me and what they have taught me over the years, little bit by little bit, lessons learned, you know, the whole nine yards. So I, so those persons would be the team of my mother and father. And their names? Lula, Reverend Lula and Reverend Hebert. Okay, Lula is? L-U-L-A, <laughs> it's my mother. And, and Hubert, H-E-B-E-R-T. That's my father's name, not mine. Okay. <laughs> I'm H. James. Okay. <laughs> well, that's beautiful. That really is. And as I recall, I think we had a conversation not long ago. You still go and visit your, they're in North Carolina, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, right. Because you're, you're still very tight with them. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, that's beautiful. Very good. Uh, yes, please. Um, I have two actually. The first is my dad, um, and they and these two people serve very different roles in my life. Okay. Um, His name? Rod, R O D. Um, and I guess as I'm sitting here thinking about what what voice he plays in my what voice he plays in my decision making in my head, there's a couple of things that come out. Um, first of all, work life balance. Um, he is a great example of that and how he's balanced having family with. Um, being a leader in a professional setting. Mm -hmm. um, also, ethics. I'm sure my dad at some point in his life has made an unethical decision, but I don't know of any. He <laughs> is very, just, it, it's, everything's not black and white. There's gray areas, but he always takes a very ethical approach to everything. Um, also, humor. My dad is known for um, being quite the dancer. And um, not in like a great way, but in an embarrassing dad way. So um, being able to approach problems in difficult times with that humor um, and not taking yourself too seriously, yes. which is, that is already paid off and I have a feeling it will pay off in future circumstances, um, but also with asking questions. Um, my dad is known for putting people in kind of uncomfortable situations where he just kind of 
lists off a bunch of questions he has for them, you know, personal questions too, which favorite color, you know, what, what do you like to eat, why do you like to do this, that at first catch you off guard, but it really helps you to develop relationships with people. So it's taught me to ask questions when I'm getting to know people. So that was my dad. Um, my other one is a boss that I had this summer, her name is Kathy Zenda Wilson. With a K or a C? Um, with a K. And she is the director of neighborhood grant making um, at the Battle Creek Community Foundation. Um, and I've just learned a lot from her about um, the approach that she takes to community work, um, which is based completely in li listening, authenticity, and innovation. So before she does anything, she always listens. Engagement in the community is the most important thing to her, um, which has become one of the most important things to me as well. Um, and she's completely authentic too. You know, you, there's not a minute that you spend with her that you don't know that she's being completely herself. Um, and innovation too. She just has a completely different way of looking at things um, that's not the status quo of how things have been done before. Um, so just being able to see the way that she approaches her community work has motivated me um, and really kind of instilled that, that passion for um, the listening and, engage and engagement part of community work. So. Great. Thank Those you. are the two people. Yes, <laughs> very good. Okay, who else? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, like Dean Williams and Jordan, correct? <laughs> said uh, there's all these voices and obviously my parents are available at any time if I need to call them. But somebody that is closer to me here um, and somebody that I met probably my second week of school was Michelle Burke. Oh, and um, now probably not a week goes by without contacting her about something or working with her on an issue. She's also sharing the initiative that I'm doing my internship for now, so that worked out really well. <laughs> but um, she uh, always encourages me along the way and makes sure, make sure, is making sure I'm leaving doors open. Sometimes I come in with a mindset. Uh, I started my college career thinking I'm gonna be a banker, and now I've done like a 180 on that, and I have a new, a new idea, but she's always making sure that I keep other options open. Uh, just the other night, I had called her, and then I had called my, or my mother had called me while I was in class, and I just got called back, and it went to Michelle's phone instead, and she answered, <laughs> and she answered, and I said, you're not my mom. <laughs> She's like, no, sometimes I feel like it. <laughs> so she shares her humor and is always making sure I'm heading in the right direction, and when I have a lot going on, she reminds me of why I'm here. And, that's to go to classes and get my diploma. So I appreciate that over the last four and a half years. Very good, thank you. you know, of course, Michelle is a very esteemed colleague to our uh, center and we, we love working with her. So it's great to get that, that endorsement. Who else? Sam. Um, I think right now I'm working for admissions and acquaintance. One thing I keep uh, turning back to think about the people who've had a big impact on my life recently and who I, I think about as I pursue, you know, different careers is really the faculty at Aquinas. And it goes back to, you know, what other people have said, there being a group of people, but at Aquinas, you know, your average class size is so small, you know, 18, 20, you know, I've had classes with seven or eight other students, and so you get a lot of time with your professors. And getting to know them, you know, through their academic advising, through, you know, working with, uh, you know, papers and even like on study abroad, we've had faculty, you know, who take you there for the first week and are there the whole time. And, uh, you know, I don't know, just the, the wealth of, of knowledge that they presented to me and how they've encouraged me and helped me develop my, you know, skills as a, a student. Uh, that's just been huge. And I, I always turn back to my two, you know, major advisors, was Dr. Shelley Ron Schaefer and John Panero. Um, yeah. Show is that with mm -hmm. S H E L L E Y? Just an I. Pardon? Just an I. Yeah. Very good. All right. Excellent. Anybody else? Yes. Um, I picked my mom. Her name is Susan. And I picked my mom because like she is the person I basically call about everything and anything in my life. And I guess she's like my like cheerleader and my harshest critic. 
in the same thing. Like, she'll like, support me and like my de- my decisions and my goals and everything. But she'll also like tell me when I'm making like a bad choice or like <laughs> maybe you should rethink that. And she'll like question me and she'll get me to think things through better than maybe I am because maybe I just like get caught up in the moment and get like really passionate about something. She's like. Are you sure that's what you want? Like, that doesn't sound very smart. Or... <laughs> <laughs> so she's just, she's always there when I need her. And she's just like set a really good example with her life. Like, she didn't go to college, but she worked in sales and hotels for a really long time. And she raised a family. And then now she takes um, care of my grandparents. So she's just like a really good caregiver and just really good even to like our elderly neighbors. Like, she takes care of them too. So. She's like the role model for me, so. Very good. Well, it's nice to get to know Susan a little yeah. bit through then. Are we going to get to meet her then? Is she going to come to our program? Um, maybe. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, very good. You raise a very interesting point, Laura. Um, is there a sense, I'd like a show of hands, the voice or voices in your head, can they call you out on the carpet when necessary? It's not always just lovey-dovey, right? Absolutely. Anybody disagree with that? There's a toughness to the people you want in your head, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, very good. Brian? I would say they could also be a counterexample at times. I know there, there are people in my life who are great at some things, not so great at others. Yeah. And so sometimes I'll think it through, that, well, my dad in that situation. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now that you've uh, volunteered something, is there somebody you'd like to put in the camp? Well, I would, I would say five of my six parents. One of them's a bit of a wild card, but five of them. <laughs> uh, usually one is a pretty good answer between my, my parents, that parents, and in-laws. You have a committee of... Yeah, yeah. and then again, yeah, you can, if someone said it, you can give them all a call and actually verify that the voice is, is true. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's have one more because then we need to wrap up because we have a very exciting presentation to follow and I don't want to take all the time. Liza. I'll go. Um, I actually, I'll make it quick. I do have two though. Um, the first one actually would be the former CEO of Million Dollar Roundtable. His name is John Prass. And, um, you know, when I started at MDRT, this was, you know, four years ago, I was very passionate about all things new, all things technology, um, you know, social media, new way of everything. And he really taught me the, the importance of the dichotomy of learning to appreciate every, um, every age group, every generation, and really understand the nuances within those. Mm-hmm. And not just to look at someone and characterize them in a certain way, but to talk through those differences with them and to understand how to focus your conversations throughout that. And one thing that he would always consistently say is air on err on the side of politeness, err on the side of ethics, err on the side of whatever you think is best. So if you're you're questioning something and you're going back and forth, err on the side of what you know is right deep down in your gut. So I would say him. And then also I was was lucky enough to work with a guy named Doug Ferguson who worked with the Hay Group. He was one of their principals. And um, they did all sorts of market research, you know, leadership development, that kind of stuff. And he had a really great way of teaching you to break apart a situation, whether it was, um, you know, some professional situation, something going on in your organization, whether or not it was a crisis situation, but to really look at all of the pieces in play and decide which pieces really were um, critical to that situation and which may be affected and which really wouldn't be. And sometimes it's easy to confuse those as you're looking at a large scale situation, but to really dedicate the time to thinking through an entire situation before you act on it, before you move on it, and then develop your communication plan based on that, so. Good, good lessons. Well, thank you very much for sharing with us your hall of heroes. And you know, when I look at uh, John and Doug and Phil, Heather, Bill, Jan, Cheryl, Jane Austen women, <laughs> Lula and Hubert, uh, Dad, uh, Rod, brother, Kathy, Michelle, John and Shelly, Susan. These are people that you should treasure because they will be with you the rest of your lives. 
And I'd like to challenge you with this thought. Uh, already, you know, we've sort of established that it's not always, you know, sometimes there'll be a tough love component in these relationships, and that's important. But uh, the other thing is, I, I want to ask you, do you think that these people will continue to leave you when they've passed on? Yes. Yes. Why do people who have died continue to lead? That seems counterintuitive. Because they've made such an impact. And I think a lot of people have said that, you know, they've led ethical lives and, and they've, again, they've just made such an impact on, on what they've done and who they've led that people just sort of look to continue to look to them. Absolutely. I mean, dead people lead us. And it's a shocking thing to realize, but it's true. And they do it because of their character, their achievements, you know, the relationships they built when they were alive. And the final thought that I would like to leave with you is that because you do have these voices in your head, and this is a good sign, you, you don't want people in your organization who do not have these voices, who do not have benchmarks, but because you do, when you face a crisis, 99% of the time, you will know what to do. You will know because you're listening to the best voice, the person who lovingly taught you, maybe tough love, but it was lovingly taught you what to do. And because then you can go to sleep at night with a clear conscience, that will be the greatest gift that this Hall of Heroes will have given to you. Thank you very much.